Each year, the REI University Center selects several innovative economic development projects, and these projects are led by experts in the field or by faculty at Michigan universities or colleges, and they are supported through small mini-grants to offset any costs associated with completing the initiative. Today, Dr. Stephen Mancouche from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor campus is presenting, along with Travis, and Travis, I didn't catch your last name. Williams. Um, Okay, and they will be presenting their um, After House project, and this is a student-led, faculty-guided, REI-supported project. Uh, this is actually part two. We funded them for the first part of it last year, and then they moved on to a, a more of an implementation phase. So we're going to hear about um, After House. And are you there, Steve? Yeah, I'm here. We're both here. Okay. We're both Whenever here. you're ready, you can start. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead um, and, and start the, the seminar, and then Travis will um, kind of come in uh, midway. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, uh, University, of Mich uh, Uni University of Michigan, but first of all, uh, Michigan State University and the REI program for identifying our project and supporting us. Um, and uh, just to quickly introduce the work, um, we have come up with a project in Detroit um, that uh, looks at uh, developing a passive solar greenhouse on top of the foundations of a uh, abandoned home um, and basically uh, allowing uh, the, uh, the warmth of the earth to sustain crops over the winter. And um, the first part of the grant we uh, received last year, we spent most of our time designing the project in terms of physical. And for the second half, uh, which is where we are now, we uh, looked at developing technical drawings, applying for a building permit, as well as fundraising uh, to raise enough money to build the first after house, which we successfully did. Um, so what we were thinking, uh, Travis and I, uh, perhaps the best way to introduce the product in a more comprehensive manner would be to uh, show you guys a video that uh, we actually launched on the fundraising site, which is called hatchfund.org. Um, this website is dedicated only to uh, art uh, and design uh, projects, and it funds artists, and designers, architects, performing artists, etc. Um, it's a not-for-profit, uh, crowdsourcing, crowdsource funding organization. And um, so we'll show you this video. Um, you can kind of see you see the address here at the top if you'd like to um, go to the website yourself. We, we are still accepting donations, so if you want to pitch in. Uh, five or twenty dollars, uh, please do so. But this will introduce to you the project and uh, the members of the project, which are really important because the project is really has only uh, come into being as a result of the people um, of the neighborhood. <laughs> After House is what the title says, is um, the construction of a new house that is made for plants now, a greenhouse, on the foundations of an old house. A lot of these houses, when they become demolished, they sit as vacant land. I feel like it's important for the community to see the installation come up, not have to wait around and wonder what this land is going to be turned into. Just being an architecture student, the architecture, I can see this space that's a completely unique structure in the form of architecture, but still retain some of the quality of the house, in the fact that it's sitting on the foundation, on the foot panel. So as we move forward, we're going to try to install these other places. Each one of them will be a piece of the architecture that's unique to that specific location. So the main concept is that the earth uh, and the temperature of the ground uh, will keep the greenhouse warm in the winter at a temperature of about uh, 45 to 50 degrees. The earth is also used for coolness in the summer. Uh, and so rather than having a greenhouse that's above the ground that's really hot in the summer, we can take advantage of the ground uh, to keep the greenhouse cool enough so that crops can go in there in the summer as well. Just have this installation after the house, so that's a place where they can gather and tie the whole community together. It'll be a place where, you know, year-round, people can come and 
architecturally just having it there and just structure in their own backyard, being able to look at it versus looking at it in the back and building, you know, probably build them with a lot of hope and facilitate further change in the community to be a relevant thing. My name is Kate Jodra, and I am a farmer here at Burnside Farms. And Burnside Farms is basically a place for growing food and building community and uh, learning to live well. Burnside Farms is a pivotal uh, aspect of this project because they're, they're the ones, or Kate and, and her crew are the ones that will be taking care of the house uh, and, uh, and will have ownership of the house. So we're very proud of that. We've been working on this for a few months, and now we need your help. We're going to need at least $12,000 to get this project off the ground, and we're not going to stop there. Every dollar raised above the minimum is going to go toward developing a kit, an afterhouse kit that can be used on other existing foundations in the city of Detroit for other community gardens. So this isn't just a cash giveaway. Your funding will not only allow this project to happen, but it will also support a strong team of artists, neighbors, architects, designers, filmmakers, graphic novelists, and more, all part of this After House team, and all important thinkers and doers in the city of Detroit. So please check out our fabulous incentives, all designed and created by our team here at After House. And if you've got an extra second, smile on Detroit. We sure appreciate it. But if you've got a couple extra dollars, go ahead and send them our way. Thanks, and I look forward to seeing you at After House. So um, that's our that was the video that we, we launched um, back in October, I believe. Um, it was pretty much after just after the summit that we had um, up at Michigan State for the first uh, for the first grant. And um, as you can see here from the website, we, we raised fourteen thousand eight hundred thirty eight dollars. So we have enough money to build the first after house project, which we are currently in the process of uh, right now, right in the midst of it. So um, I'm going to launch this PowerPoint presentation just to um, kind of talk a little bit more about who our partners are and then uh, a brief introduction to the overall concept um, behind the house. Also talks a little bit about the neighborhood that we're working in. Um, so basically the location is 2347 Burnside, uh, Michigan, Detroit. Um, it's a neighborhood just north of Hamtramck. And um, the project was actually uh, uh, conceived by an artist called Abigail Murray, uh, and she came across the project. Um, she's a gardener and an artist and was at a hoop house meeting uh, here in Ann Arbor about in 2009 when she came um, across a conversation about uh, somebody that visited some um, geothermal greenhouses in South America called Wallapinis. And um, this person described them as uh, being built up in the, in the Andes Mountains at high altitude where there were uh, large variations in temperature between daytime and nighttime um, um, fluctuation in temperatures. Um, and basically, uh, the Ayamara Indians developed this technology to grow um, plants that would be able to, uh, at night, use the, the warmth of the earth and resist uh, freezing. And so, um, after after that hoop house meeting, through conversations, she was telling me, you know, it would be really great to to think about this um, this technology here in Michigan, and it just came as sort of a very obvious um, uh, solution to look at uh, existing houses and why why uh, bury 
something in the ground when there might be already a hole somewhere that we could use. And, and so she started thinking about um, homes in Detroit that were being left behind um, or abandoned and uh, reusing the resources of the ground. Um, so other uh, members of our team are um, University of Michigan students, Travis uh, Williams, who's a junior in architecture school, um, and Edward Sachs, who's um, also a junior and could not come today. Um, and myself, uh, as well as uh, Jonathan Sturt, who's a lecturer in architecture, um, and Matthew Schulte, uh, who used to, was a former uh, faculty here at Michigan and now um, is a collab research collaborator of mine. Uh, we also have um, Kate Dodrill, who um, basically was introduced to you through the video, who is uh, the artist and also the farmer at Burnside Farms, and Andrew Malone, who was also in the video, and he was original owner of the house, uh, and he used to live on the corner of Burnside side and purchased the house because it was uh, being vandalized and he was just worried that the whole block might get negatively influenced. So um, he ended up purchasing the house and paying taxes on it for three years even though it was uh, in, the, in its burnt condition until we approached him and Kate uh, to launch this project and uh, we were so lucky to find them um, both interested and willing to do the project but finding somebody that's going to take care of of this project uh, long term. Um, across the street lives um, Jamin Townsend, who was a filmmaker who made that amazing video. Um, so we were very much blessed by um, just the neighbors and the people there uh, in terms of putting this work together. Um, we have additionally uh, received help from Mary Dar uh, in engineering, Douglas Kelba, who's a professor of architecture here uh, at Taubman College. Um, as well as Mike Palmer, who is the, the director of, um, he's a manager, I think, uh, of the, at the Methe Botanical Gardens. Uh, he manages all the, the plants um, in, the, in, the, in the conservatory. Um, <clears throat> so just to talk about this uh, in terms of uh, the, the overall idea behind the work, um, there is about uh, 70 tons of concrete in the foundation um, uh, of, a, of a house, and uh, right now with the plan of the city of Detroit, how many houses they plan on demolishing? Oh, 4,000. 4,000 houses, right. So you can only imagine 4,000 times, times 70 tons of concrete being landfilled. Um, so to, to believe, to think about the resources and the amount of energy spent in the creation of concrete, um, Concrete is one of the materials that creates the largest amount of greenhouse gases, um, far, uh, farther, uh, much more than any other industry uh, as, a sing as a single producer of greenhouse gases. So the idea of, of just uh, not throwing this material um, away um, is something that seemed very much appealing to us. Um, there is labor involved in pulling that out as well. So I think at its core, this is one of the fundamental um, propositions of the project is to reuse the existing foundations of a house and to see them as something that is valuable. Um, the neighborhood that we're working in is uh, just to the north of Hamtramck and I need to go forward quickly. Um, you can kind of see here, um, this is uh, a is the, the, the house that we're working on over here. This is the Hamtramck Detroit uh, border to the north of Hamtramck. Cross Carpenter. Um, the neighborhood is pretty much uh, very much similar to uh, the Hamtramck neighborhood itself. It's been, in its origin, uh, was developed for a Polish uh, working class population. And over the years, as they moved out, um, a lot of new immigrants moved into the neighborhood. And now, predominantly, the, the two uh, largest group of immigrant population in that neighborhood are um, Bengalis and uh, Yemenis. And um, they, it's an important, it's a very interesting neighborhood as a result because it, it keeps uh, the root, its sort of roots of working class roots intact. And this is uh, Burnside that you can kind of see here. Um, it's uh, this section of Burnside is a dead end street. So dead end streets often are plagued by vandalism more so than uh, streets that have uh, traffic going through them. And uh, these two houses here, these two lots are circled in yellow. Those houses um, have actually, actually the three, I think this house here has been demolished too. 
Uh, these, these three houses have been uh, demolished since this photograph was taken on Google Earth, which is not that long ago. So Kate's house is right here, right next to the uh, after house, which is A. And across the street are two houses that are in, in good shape and are occupied. So as you can kind of see, this on Burnside um, after house is the only house left, really, that is in the state it currently is. So the project is significant also because it tends to solidify this one um, part of the neighborhood um, into one uh, cohesive uh, urban agricultural area. I would call it more of a community garden, really, than agriculture. Um, and, uh, and, and that's why we felt also that there was a significance to this project. The neighborhood itself, you can see here, um, is populated by these houses, um, which are, are basically um, yeah, small bungalows, uh, blue-collar bungalows, I like to call them. And, and they all have the same footprint on them uh, of foundation. And you can, you can see here in 1922, this is when the, the neighborhood was developed. Um, and by 1955, <clears throat> at its peak, this is where all the houses that were occupied in the neighborhood. And in 2013, outlined um, in red are possible sites of intervention. Uh, which basically means that um, these are all houses that are in current disrepair um, and that are slated uh, for possible demolition and that also have the same exact foundation type that we are working with. So the project immediately shows potential in terms of development just in this neighborhood. Um, certainly the conditions for this type of work, it's not only that we need sort of the physical setup to make the project happen, um, more important is actually the, uh, the community itself and the people that are going to take care of these houses themselves. So in a way, we see this first after house as a demonstration project, not only in terms of how it's going to work physically, but also in terms of its uh, sustainability uh, economically and, and to see like how it works within the neighborhood itself. But there's a lot of promise. <clears throat> um, so this is the current condition of the house that you've seen in the video. It's been fire damaged. We, um, the front of the house actually doesn't look nearly as bad as the back side, um, where there's a large hole, etc. Um, but um, it, the house is uh, irreparable. And this is a, a shot of the interior. You can kind of start understanding the uh, the level of damage on the interior of the house. Um, so this concept of the wallapini or the or the sunken uh, garden is not uh, something new at all. It's a technology that. It's actually currently used at Matei Botanical Gardens where they bury some of their uh, crops uh, for the winters and, um, and then cover them actually with solid uh, panels um, and then they just pull them out in the, uh, when, when summer comes. Um, but the idea is that, again, that the, the earth uh, itself can uh, help sustain the temperature um, and moderate it. This gives you a quick idea of what the foundation looks like um, of the house itself. So this is the neighbor's house. This is Kate's house. Um, burnt the 2347 is an identical house. Um, in this neighborhood, they would only build a, a foundation on the back part of the house. And the front part of the house was um, a porch and a crawl space area. So this, this part here of Kate's house um, does not have a basement below it. And I believe that was done to save money. Um, and so our proposal is to put this cap on top of the house. Its pitch is, um, it looks a bit strange because it's actually pitching due south. So the, the site here is, faces north-south, um, but it's not, this is not completely uh, parallel with the south. It's, the south is actually on an angle to the house, and that's why we rotated the pitch. Um, so maybe here, uh, Travis, you can talk a little bit more about yes, the and, and so on. In this slide, you can clearly see some of the different uh, crops we'll be able to grow in the after house. Uh, we'll be able to extend some of subtropical uh, plants and extend the growing season in Michigan, which usually ends about, what, November? Yes. Uh, we'll probably be able to extend it well until maybe January, depending on how many uh, sub-zero temperatures we get in between then. You can also see some of the construction materials we'll be using to extend the growing season in conjunction with saving the foundation wall. Um, polycarbonate would be the clear panels we'll use uh, in place of glass. It's a little more durable and uh, it lets in a little bit more light, uh, the flexibility with its reflectivity uh, kind of gives it a nice uh, aesthetic. 
Uh, we'll also be using structural insulated panels or SIPS panels, uh, which have a pretty high R value, so they'll be able to um, contain some of that uh, thermal energy that's collected during the day and trap it in during the night. Um, we've also, uh, we'll also be using corrugated steel and uh, hardwood cutoffs. So we kind of had the fortune of finding a company that had a lot of uh, waste material from producing wood shingles. And that's part of uh, one of our other goals with the after house, to try to salvage as much of the building materials as possible from the demolition of the home. So hardwood cutoffs will kind of stand in for uh, some of the wood uh, lumber that we try to salvage from uh, future after house endeavors. Uh, so you can see here, this is kind of represents the design sequence. Uh, it starts with the derelict home, um, which would be 3347 uh, Burnside. And we plan on demolishing everything but the foundation and possibly leaving the first floor to hold the foundation wall intact while we uh, build the platform and insulation that will go around the after house. Uh, we first start by insulating the ground around it. Uh, that helps trap in some of the thermal uh, energy. And then we'll build a sh simple shed uh, greenhouse uh, with the polycarbonate uh, panels. Next, we'll rotate it so we can face due south. Uh, in this case, uh, like Stephen mentioned earlier, uh, it doesn't sit directly north and south, so we kind of rotate it on the axis. Uh, next, we slice slice the building to fit the foundation uh, so we can kind of retain some of the character of the original structure. And we readjust the shape and next we allow for it to uh, have a plantable envelope uh, which would be the porch. And the porch is a very important uh, part of the structure because it kind of mediates in the next slide you can see a little better. It kind of serves as an intermediate space between the public and private domain. Uh, yes, and as you can see from this slide, uh, the porch, like I said, it acts as an intermediate space. So depending on how the house is oriented on the street, uh, whether it's north facing, south facing, east or west, uh, we can position the porch uh, to allow for maximum uh, solar heat gain during the summer months and winter months to prolong the growing season. Um, the porch kind of stands in between, you know, and in, invites people to come engage uh, the after house, the people from the community. And that's kind of an important factor uh, when trying to, like I said, create an architecture that retains some of, you know, what makes it uh, kind of fit, fit in with the surrounding homes in the community. So here you can see a breakdown of each individual element of the construction. Uh, the original house is taken off. We do use the polycarbonates on the SIF panels, uh, which are supported by trusses, uh, do-it-yourself trusses. So, uh, we're trying to make the construction process as much as, uh, as simple as possible so it can be replicated and mass produced. Um, then you have standard wood framing, uh, hardwood cutoff slabs, the SIF panels, and as you can see here in the front, here's the porch with uh, planter boxes surrounding it and the existing foundation wall. So here's a quick, uh, simple diagram of how it actually works. Uh, it allows the sun to come in and during the day, uh, the roof is pitched at what, 23 degrees? It's the 4 and 12. Oh, 4 and 12, yeah. So uh, the roof is pitched to allow maximum solar heat gain. Uh, the heat's trapped by the foundation wall and the insulation, which uh, during night is released into the soil. And uh, she'll be able to grow pretty tall uh, kind of dwarf trees, a variety of different uh, species. Yeah, so you can see you can have uh, different um, configurations of how you want your planter beds, growing medium, uh, whether you want trees, smaller crops, shrubs. Uh, so it's pretty diverse. You can even uh, install green walls if you want on some of the walls. I don't know if we need to talk about the floor plans, but and this, this is a quick view of what the floor plans are. Uh, these are the kind of drawings that we <coughs> submitted for the building permit. 
they're actually a little bit more technical than these, but. Um, but the beauty of it is that it could be adapted to fit pretty much any home with an uh, intact foundation, which is the plan. Uh, we um, want to create a kit of parts that we can open source and allow for people to use this as an intervention around the country in urban areas uh, that have been hit by the housing crisis or um, just a bad real estate market or as a temporary intervention in between finding a homeowner that wants to eventually move back in. And the other thing that we see um, this, you can kind of see it in this slide, is like, so they're technical aspects of the project, but the idea that a lot of these communities um, are very active in the summer months because, you know, the kids are out in the streets playing and there's just a lot of activity in the neighborhood, but in the winter things are pretty much indoors and like the rest of Michigan, there's like less social, social interchange going on and the one thing that we were hoping is because of the space um, being warmer um, in the winter would actually maybe bring the neighborhood a little bit more together, at least in this very small space. Uh, the people immediately close to the house would have something um, where they could um, come to with uh, um, Kate, uh, the, the farmer um, and artist, her, her, art, her art practice involves reaching out to, involves basically food and um, activities with the community. So she is hoping to use the house um, for that to extend extend the, the garden that she has in the summer uh, to the community as well in the winter. And this is a bleak picture of maybe what we're talking about, <laughs> especially this past winter. Yeah. Uh, where, um, this is facing directly south, so you can, you can see the angle of the house. Um, and so it has a sort of strange skew to it that you can kind of see um, here at the front, it would be actually quite low. So this is um, this is like a normal handrail height. Uh, so if you're standing, you know, your head would be above the lowest part of the shed roof. You could look down into it. Um, but we also kept this planter box here on the front, uh, which basically shows the scale of the original house, and it acts as a as both a welcoming device, but also a way of creating separation with the street um, because in a way, that's the interesting thing about a porch is that it tends to be both welcoming, but also um, I don't know what the opposite word of welcoming is. But it it it's, it sets a it sets yeah. a sort of middle point, right, where you between can, public and between private. Between public and private, right? And that's what we're hoping that this uh, front garden, the front garden to to the after house, will do as well. And here you can see um, what we sort of envision this to look like in the summer. Um, with uh, people in the community um, working. Um, this is not Kate. She was not willing to stand <laughs> for the image. Um, and this is where we are now. Um, we have, uh, last week, uh, got our building permit from the city of Detroit. So that was a, a big deal for us. Um, that means that um, the project has been accepted by the legal officials of the city to be built um, and there were some obstacles that we faced but um, uh, we felt that the city was very much supportive of, of the project. Um, we, uh, I think the reasons for the support is we are not proposing any radical change. We are um, maintaining the scale of the neighborhood. We are, um, we are operating um, by the books, this is not a project that is being done off the radar and then it's just going to suddenly appear. It's very important for us that um, all the steps in the work that we're doing are um, legitimate because we feel that um, if the project is successful that other people can then approach the city of Detroit and get a building permit um, and using what we've done yeah. as a case study for, for their projects. Um, and we are already working with some other communities um, uh, to look at possible projects there, but we also feel it's very important for us to get this one off the ground and really uh, prove it, prove yeah. that it works. Yeah, by this one being a prototype, it'll really test our theories on its agency, on how long it can extend the growing season. Um, and, and it'll also allow us to make improvements and adjustments as we go further. 
along with the process of uh, possibly bringing the cost down on the amount of time it takes uh, improving the design process and uh, maybe even integrating other uh, ideas into uh, as far as sustainability uh, water systems or a variety of other uh, ways to improve upon it and make it uh, more sustainable, more feasible uh, to be implemented at a city scale. And these are um, just some of the collaborators. Again, this is the uh, the website where we uh, did the funding, um, which does accept more funding. <laughs> um, and uh, some of the, the members. This is a photograph of Abigail Murray. Yeah, I think that's it in terms of our presentation. Uh, perhaps we can um, open it up to questions from, from your end. Thanks, Stephen and Travis. I'm looking and I don't see a whole lot of live attendees, but um, I do have a couple of questions for you. I'm sure you're well aware of this, that Brightmore is kind of leading in the effort of um, more urban gardening small-scale urban gardening. Um, they've also got a, a huge artistic kind of, I don't know, emphasis going on in their neighborhood. But have you approached them? Do, are they familiar with this? Do they understand what's going on, what you're doing? Um, <laughs> uh, we have not uh, talked to them directly yet. Uh, we approached someone from the Brightmore community uh, in Blight Busters, which was working in concert with uh, the Brightmore community. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now, we've been focused on trying to get this first prototype up, so we'll have something to show when we come to them and something to present. Sure. And that way, we can also work out uh, other design problems that may come, because every foundation is not the same. Mm -hmm. But we also have to figure out how we can uh, tweak the design. Uh, yeah, I understand it. that. Yeah, the, I mean, it's a very, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, how to, how to go about the project and how to how to find the right partners. Um, when we started the project in 2009, I think in 2010, we applied for a Ford C3 grant. Um, and we actually uh, applied with Lightbusters at that time, um, sort of partnership with them. But it was hard for us to get the wheels going because there were a lot of moving parts from their end um, and from our end as well. And we ended up not getting the grant, which was supposed to fund the project. So. Um, when we came across um, Andy Malone and we started looking at all the characters in that small road, it seemed to be a, like a lot of the things just fell in, in the right spot where we said, okay, we can, we can make this work here right now. And as we're doing it, and actually as we're building it, contact the other uh, people in other communities so that they can actually come and witness the construction process as well so that there would be... Mm -hmm more of a, um, I don't know what you call it, like a sort of a hand, handed down sort of memory of people that worked on something mm -hmm. that, that could say, oh yeah, this is how they did it over there, um, kind of a situation. So I think that the, that we should be, we, we should, you know, you did reach out to... Um, Mr. Jules. Yeah, uh, yeah, earlier, and, and we might want to just have them come along um, at different phases, because we're going to be doing a lot of the so overall volunteer work will be done on Sundays. So um, we can set up a schedule and have, have it such that other, you know, so, so it's completely, you know, open for people to come and witness. Mm -hmm. Not to mention that I really do feel like it's important to reach out to different people in the community and pull together their resources, uh, tap into the resources that's already surround. Um, this could be a great opportunity as an incubator for jobs, too, as well. Um, there's deconstruction. That was what I was thinking. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, deconstruction. There's the, the whole growing part of it. Um, yeah, there are some skills to be learned while this is, this is being developed, from beginning yeah. to finish to the end. I can yeah. see a lot of skill development. I can see um, entrepreneurs from the growing of the vegetables and and there's some unique vegetables. I mean, this was something I was going to make a comment about. Maybe I missed it, but the pomegranates and some of yeah. these other, I mean, that is really unusual. So that's right. got an added value in itself that you could make jellies right. from the pomegranates and <laughs> get connected with MSU and their product center and food lab down in Detroit. And Yeah, we should. We, we definitely need to 
to do that. We feel that um, the, the the amount of space is only it's a small it's a small foundation. It's only twenty by twenty. So in mm -hmm. a way, the project really calls for a much more sort of higher value crop in there. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, um, the growing of sort of herbs, for example, winter herbs, which are very expensive to buy in the markets, would be one good way to generate income for some people. Mm -hmm. um, what the house does is it doesn't, it's not a hot house, so you can't grow, let's say, tomatoes or something like that because it's not heated. Right. But what it does is it, it, it moderates, it, it moderates zones. So instead of uh, planting uh, zone 5B or 6, which is Detroit, you can plant zone 7 plants, um, which means that you can grow pomegranates and pistachios and um, different types of plants that would be of higher value. But yeah. We also feel that the project has, it's much more, um, there are certainly economic aspects to it, but additionally to that, it, what it does provide is it, it has this whole other social part, um, mm -hmm. which, which we feel is very important um, in terms of the way it, it works. Right, the interaction that, that they're going to get from being involved yeah, in the neighborhood. I'm sure there's been a lot of curiosity about what you're doing. I <laughs> mean, from been, the neighborhood. Yeah, there has been curiosity in the neighborhood, and we've also received some press from. I think it was in it was a Metro Mode. Metro Mode did something, and um, there's some other you know, news outlets that are interested in. The Can project. you send that to me? The any yeah. press? Okay, that'd be good. Absolutely. We'd like to ad advance this for you and help you, you know, to keep to keep everybody in the loop that should be, you know, and build those partners like you're saying. That, that'll help yeah. to, to, to get the support that you need in the end, yeah. whether it's funding yeah. or not. You know, maybe Dan yeah. Gilbert should get involved, who knows. <laughs> yeah, and also we feel that, I mean, the way we, the project started is really, we conceived of it as something that we'd like, want, we really want to involve, be involved with one and then enable others to do more mm -hmm. of it. And the idea of the kit is an interesting one. Um, so that might be one route where we do something that is more of a, gives, it's, it's more like the recipe of how to make it, mm -hmm. um, that then you sort of pass on. And so our involvement would be more at, at the level of somebody that writes down the recipe and then helps out. Yeah. Um, but another way to sort of see the, the project um, is as a, as a way of safekeeping the resource itself, meaning that... Yeah. If, you know, when you demolish the house and you rip out the foundations, you don't have anything left. You pull out all the utilities and all that. All you have is, you know, the land that's left. And if, if you could find a way to, pres what this does is in a way it preserves the foundation. So let's say in 15 years something strange happens and things are so much better and somebody wants to. That wouldn't be strange. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm saying strange because I'm trying to be... Yeah, something wonderful. I'm to be, like, um, too, optimistic. too optimistic, right? <laughs> but let's say the neighborhood, you know, got much better and uh, real estate went up. You, you can tr turn after house back into the house that it was before. There's wow. nothing, you know, that's what it does. It's like a little cap that you put mm -hmm. on top of it and you're using it in the meantime, you know, mm -hmm. to, to enliven... Preserving. That addresses this highest and best use kind of argument. There are some that are not in favor of urban gardening in Detroit because yeah. the infrastructure that is there, this was supposed to be an urban area, not an yeah. agricultural you know, zone. And so some are arguing the saying, well, that's not the highest and best use for the city of Detroit. You know, we should, we should really have homes there. We should have businesses. And, and so if you can say, well, wait a minute, we're preserving, you know, this, yeah. this piece of property so that it can be reverted back to the way it was intended, in which case you would be able to tap back into the infrastructure exactly. once again. And that's, that's really how we, how we see, let's see the work, but it's also clear that, that this type of project has to, be, has to be driven by the people that live on the street. It's not, yes. I mean, when we, we, we over the years, we, we realized this more and more and more, and, um, and that's why perhaps we ended up with this partnership where Everybody on the street is really so invested that we were really blessed, honestly. And mm -hmm. It was really evident when we went to get the building permit, um, for example, issues like clear ownership of the, of the property, who owns it, where the back tax is paid, are there any other issues that are on the record that could stop the project? Because one must realize that it's not 
we don't work in abstract here. We're working with a city that has laws and regulations. So the way we approach the project is Kate um, ended up buying the house from Andy, joining the two lots, and making it into one lot. And then so when those things happen and people start taking ownership, the city feels much more comfortable issuing the permit because they're, okay, I know who owns it. Um, mm -hmm. I know that they're going to pay their taxes, and they have paid their taxes. Mm -hmm. So all these are really important issues um, that we that can get very complicated and that we felt that we were very lucky to just get this project going, at least to see it work. We didn't want it to get stopped in some sort of bureaucratic pit uh, where we yeah. didn't know who, who was ownership, who's going to take care of it after, and what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And it's not that we don't want to do projects like that. We just want to make one survive at least. <laughs> and then, yeah. you know, if at least one can happen, then maybe others um, that might have other complications could resolve their complications and make it happen. Yeah, and you mm -hmm. set a precedence that, you know, will make it easier for the next uh, after house to go through the permitting process. Not to mention that, uh, you know, spark people's imagination a little bit better. It's a lot easier for people to grasp something that already is. And it's something they have, you know, to visually look at and draw a reference mm -hmm. from and have them completely imagine it from scratch. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was very critical to get this first one done, to get it done eventually. Uh, yeah. This summer. Well, I wish you the best. This is this is very exciting. I think it's it, it's a great endeavor, and um, I, we will promote it. We'll we'll keep promoting as long as you, you need us to through social media and sharing the link to this webinar and all of your videos that you've created are great. The film is amazing, but the photography, like I said before we started, is really well done. So hats off to you guys. Um, keep up the good work, and I guess we're going to see you at the summit, so you'll be able to, you'll probably have maybe some repeat visitors from last year's presentation that will be eager to hear you know, where, you, where you've gone with it in your next steps. Is the summit going to be again in September? Yes, September 4th. Yeah, hopefully you could make it. Um, we have you on the agenda, so hopefully you're, you can yeah, bring maybe your, your team. Hopefully we'll be showing pictures of the thing built. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know that that'll is, be really great. We're hoping. I mean, yeah. That's, that's, that is the plan. So. Okay, well, yeah, stay focused. Keep working okay. hard. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much, and um, yeah. <laughs> and I, I guess yeah, w I'll talk to you soon, and, and okay. get ready right. for the summit. Right. Okay. Have a good day. Right.